everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. It has been an especially tough week for the OSU family. As you likely know, a retired agricultural professor is among those who died in the parade tragedy. Dr. Marvin Stone had a tremendous impact on the world of crop sensors and agricultural technology. We'll take a look back at his life's work a little bit later in the show. But first, we're talking cotton. SUNUP's Dave Deacon takes us to Washita County for some cotton research. Back in June and July, we were talking with Randy Bowman about some of the cotton varieties across southern Oklahoma. But Randy, we're up here in Washita County. Let's talk about the trial that's going on here. Well, Dave, we're actually at uh, one of uh, Danny Davis's farms, and this has been a no-till farm for I think about 20 years. I'd have to double check with Danny on that. And here on the property you have several different varieties of cotton seed and, and this is part of a, a, a larger trial that you're doing. Yes, it's one of our what we refer to as our race trial locations. That's the acronym for Replicated Agronomic Cotton Evaluation Trial. And basically what we do is we work with the seed companies and give them an opportunity to basically select and plant one entry per brand name that they have. And so uh, we also allow our cooperator, in this case, uh, Danny, to uh, have a grower's choice in this field. And this is one of the older style technologies. It's Bolgard II Roundup Ready Flex. Right. So as you'll notice, we just have Roundup Ready Flex only as a herbicide tolerance in this particular trait. And uh, 1044 was released in the class of 10, and the 44 indicates that it was a kind of a medium to maybe late maturity, mid to late maturity mm -hmm. perhaps. But uh, anyway, the Bolgard II, of course, is the insect protection. So again, just straight Roundup Ready Flex technology in this particular variety. This has been a standard for a lot of people in our area, and it's really good to have this in the trial because as we go down and look at some of the newer varieties with the new technologies, um, we will be able to compare the performance of those back to this known standard. So Randy, what we have here is Phytogene 333 and, and you can kind of see the difference between the two, two plants here. Yes, this variety tends to be a little bit more growthy than the 1044, which it's adjacent to. Uh, the 333 is a new line of genetics from the Phytogen Breeding Program, and it contains the Wide Strike Roundup Ready Flex technology. The Wide Strike is the insect resistance component that makes the plants more uh, resistant, basically, to the caterpillar pests. The Wide Strike is is a Dow product, and of course the Roundup Ready Flex is a Monsanto product. So what we have is a stack gene system with part of the trait belong, one of the traits belonging to Monsanto and right. the other one belonging to Dow. But the 333 has performed pretty well for us last year. Um, we do anticipate seeing some of the new Enlist cotton mm -hmm. down the road in 20, probably 2017. Okay. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll show up in the 333 background, and of course the Enlist technology will be the uh, cotton varieties from Dow and Phytogen that will be, will be tolerant to uh, glyphosate, uh, Liberty herbicide, as well as the 2,4-D choline product that uh, Dow will market and sell for that particular technology. Well, Randy, what cotton variety are we looking at right here? Well, Dave, this is the new FiberMax 1900 GLT variety, the GLT stands for Glytol, Liberty Link, and Twin Link. The Glytol is Bayer Crop Sciences proprietary glyphosate tolerance gene okay. that's used in the, uh, in the cotton. Of course, the Liberty Link is also a Bayer trait that's been around for some time. Right. And uh, it's, it's actually used in, in other varieties uh, as well. And then, of course, we have the Twin Link, which is really Bayer's proprietary BT. Uh, again, it is a, a dual gene BT system that's totally proprietary to Bayer. Mm -hmm. The 1900 has done pretty well in some of the other uh, testing that's been conducted in the region, mm -hmm. and it was Bayer's selection to go in this particular trial. Uh, we can see that it actually has, in, at least it, in, in this particular area right here, it looks like it's got some uh, level of growth to it compared to some of the other entries here. Right. So um, we would suspect that uh, this might need a little bit more plant growth regulator uh, during the growing season perhaps. But uh, again, this is the first time that we've had this particular entry in the area, so we're kind of anxious to find out how this will do for us. And Randy, we're here at the Next Gen 3406. Let's talk about this variety. Well, this particular variety contains the new Monsanto trait, uh, which would impart the dicamba tolerance. Right. And that, that trait is called Extend Flex. 
and it's also stacked with Bogard too, which again is Monsanto's insect trait. But let's talk about the Extend Flex trait because what that does, that's gonna be the first legal system, you might say that the, the first uh, approved system from USDA that will allow us to potentially apply up to three different types of herbicides over the top. And what the Extend Flex imparts is, is tolerance to dicamba, which will be a new chemistry with respect to what will be sprayed on this cotton. It's an old chemistry in a lot of respects, but what will happen when, when Monsanto does get the products approved through EPA, it will be a lower volatile formulation, it will have less drift potential, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the cool thing is, again, this is replicated eight times across the region, uh, across Oklahoma. Yes. Talk about that, that partnership with the growers and the seed companies. Well, you know, we started this program and, and it's still continuing in Texas and, and we brought this with us to Oklahoma. There's been a lot of interest in this. The seed companies are, are pretty excited to have these trials out there because basically they get to take a look at what they want to look at right. and the grower gets to look at what he wants to look at and we all gain some because of the new new traits, new technologies, new varieties. So we do have some opportunities here to get uh, some really, I think, uh, very meaningful data. And from a grower perspective, I know it's a, it's a little hassle for them. Uh, it slows them down, certainly some at planting, but uh, probably more so at harvest than at planting. But I think that uh, there's enough value in this testing program that the growers really appreciate it. Okay, thank you much, Randy you Bowman, bet. our cotton extension specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. No rain, fast-moving rain, lots of rain. We have really been getting a taste of so many forms of wet and dry this year. Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, we had a taste of an unusual, small, fast-moving system that raced through the state. Fast-moving, yet look how many Mesonet sites recorded rainfall amounts over the state. The Mesonet recorded the first rain from this system in Goodwell at 1025 Tuesday evening. The last rain fell in Tallahena just over 12 hours later at 1110 Wednesday morning. Rainfall amounts were very light with this minor system. The highest recorded rainfall was at Woodward, 29 hundredths of an inch. Only seven sites had two-tenths of an inch or more. Many sites had less than a tenth of an inch. How fast did this system fly through the state? Here is a radar image from the Oklahoma City radar just after 8 a.m. Three hours later, we have to jump to the Tulsa radar and most of the system has exited the state. Hopefully you got more rain from the much larger, slower system that finished out our week on Thursday and Friday. Here's Gary with a check on the drought monitor and a look ahead. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Well, that rainfall we had across the southern half of the state last week really kicked drought in the teeth. Let's take a look at the latest U.S. Drought Minor Report and see what we have. Well, as you can see, much of the extreme to severe drought across the southern third of the state has disappeared. Just a little patch of uh, severe drought left in far southwest Oklahoma and some moderate drought here and there. Now, we do see moderate drought uh, a little bit up in north central Oklahoma and northwest Oklahoma where they didn't get as much rainfall. Um, but you also see complete drought removal across much of southern Oklahoma. So that rain really hit the mark. I showed you the winter outlook last week, but what about for the next few weeks? Well, the 8 to 14 day precipitation outlook from the Climate Prediction Center, and this is for November 4th or November 10th, we see another period of increased chances uh, of rainfall. So that looks good for next week. And as we go farther out for the November 7th through November 20th period, we also see increased odds of above normal precipitation. So maybe these last couple of rainstorms weren't a fluke and El Nino is really starting to kick in. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. We want to talk now about weeds in canola fields with Angela Post, our extension weed scientist. And Angela, what kind of weeds are you seeing this time of year? 
So we're starting to get our canola up a little bit larger and we're seeing a lot of weeds emerging as well in that crop. Most of the ones we're, we're concerned about this time of year are gonna be the weedy mustards because they're in the same family as canola. The main mustards that we're concerned about in canola right now are uh, bushy wallflower, shepherd's purse, field pepper weed, uh, and wild radish and we're also concerned with mare's tail which is not a mustard but also is a rosette that's difficult to tell apart from this group. You've identified a couple of those what do we see right here? So right here we have shepherd's purse so this one is actually already flowering many of the mustard um, species will not be flowering yet but we see that has a nice rosette and a lot of cuts in the leaves this is classic um, identifying characters for the mustard family. We're going to have a, a nice rosette all the way through the winter and then usually these are going to bolt once the days start to get longer in spring. Um, Shepherd's Purse is one of the few that can bolt at different times of the year and you can see it's already started uh, flowering and making its nice little um, Shepherd's Purse shaped seed pods. Uh, almost all of the mustards will have either a white or a yellow flower with four petals and uh, compete very well with canola, um, particularly this time of year when the canola plants are still small. We also have wild radish. This one is a, a little bit larger statured specimen, so we have um, larger leaves. There are lots of hairs on the leaves, so you might be able to see these little bumps, and each one of those little bumps on the leaf surface has a hair coming out of it. Uh, these will get large. They can be as large or larger than canola plants um, and make a very large rosette that's very competitive with the crop. So we want to take care of those very early. So the others, um, bushy wallflower also makes a fairly large rosette. It's fa pretty easy to tell from the other ones because the cuts don't go so deep on the leaf, especially when it's a small rosette. has more of a linear leaf with like some little um, bumps along the edges that are kind of scalloped. It also will not be flowering right now. Um, and then we have field pepperweed. This one's going to be a much, much smaller rosette with really fine divisions on the leaf surface. Um, not many hairs at all. And it makes a really, really tight rosette. And these are also not flowering right now, but it's a good time to control them in canola. And the final one, which is not a mustard, is mare's tail. This one is problematic in wheat and canola, and it can germinate all through the winter season. So we see germination now, and we'll see germination all the way through March. And these are the ones that you see sticking up out of the tops of the soybean fields this time of year um, as we're going in to try and, and harvest soybeans. So it's really a problematic weed in almost all of our cropping systems. But it also makes a small rosette and we'll, we'll see some images of that here. When you visit with producers, what kind of advice do you give them in terms of managing these weeds? So for canola, we're um, unfortunate that we only have a couple of products labeled for broadleaf weed control, and those are going to be glyphosate in our Roundup Ready cropping system, which would encompass about 90% um, or better of our cropping system here in Oklahoma. And that's going to allow you 22 ounces of Roundup um, at, a, at a particular time. And it's usually going to be applied two to six leaf canola, but many producers will wait and apply it a little bit later. Uh, that is your option for the Roundup Ready system and then for conventional canola we have a product called Stinger. Um, it's pretty weak on mustard weeds but it's the only option that they have for broadleaf weed control. Now we're standing here in your sort of research area at the agronomy station. Briefly just tell me what you do and how you educate students here hands-on. So um, this is also our field laboratory. We bring students out here every single week um, from the beginning of the semester all the way through freezing temperatures and let them see what's going on out in the field. We use these plots here for um, teaching herbicide symptomology. We use them for teaching identification like we're learning here today on SUNUP. And we also learn them um, to or use them to learn how to uh, troubleshoot grower problems because many of our students are going on to be um, tech service representatives they're going to work at co-ops, they're going to be custom applicators, and they really need that knowledge of how to go out and visit with a grower and understand what their problem is. Many times it's a weed control problem that they are trying to troubleshoot and figure out what is my weed, how do I control it, and what is the application rate I'm going to put out. And, and we use our field laboratory um, to kind of direct those things to the students and, and get them educated before they leave us. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much, Angela. We'll see you again soon. And for a link to some of the weed identification that Angela mentioned, just go to sunup.okstate.edu.
the fall calving season has pretty well wrapped up from most fall calving herds uh, here in the southern plains and that means that the next big event that we're concerned about of course is getting those cows rebred. Research here at Oklahoma State University indicates that it's very important that these cows not lose a lot of body condition between the end of the calving season and going into the breeding season. If you look at this particular graphic it's actually done with spring calving cows but it illustrates the point that uh, cows that lose nearly a full body condition between the end of calving and going into the breeding season have a lowered rebreeding percentage. In this particular case cows that uh, lost to, from about a 5.4 body condition down to a 4.6 had 21 percent lower rebreeding rate than did their counterparts that were fed to maintain that body condition into and through the breeding season. The question then becomes what do we do in order to assure that the cows that calve this fall maintain that good body condition that they, they were in at calving uh, through the, the rest of this month and December and uh, through the completion of the breeding season. Doing a, a little bit of calculation and, and looking at the uh, nutrient requirement tables for beef cows, I find that uh, these cows will need uh, is, let's say they're 1,100 pound cows that are giving just an average amount of milk for, for beef cattle. They're going to need about three and three quarter pounds per head per day of a high protein supplement, say a 40% crude protein supplement, something like cottonseed cake. Now if we choose to feed uh, a lower protein supplement, something like a 30%, one of the blends, then we'd have to of course increase that amount to about 5 pounds per head per day for that size cow. As long as they've got adequate amount of forage or decent quality grass hay available to them on a daily basis, then this should supply the protein as well as the energy that these cows need to lactate as well as maintain that body condition. Maintaining body condition on these cows from the end of calving into and through the breeding season will be very important in terms of getting a very high breed up percentage so that we have a good calf crop the next year and of course that helps our bottom line. Hey we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. It's been another week of very small movements in the wheat market. Kim, where are we at? Well, we've seen uh, wheat prices in Oklahoma go up about 15 cents this week. Uh, you look at the December contract, it's trading from about $4.70 to just below $5, moving in that sideways pattern. Uh, if you look at the uh, support, it's got very strong support on the December contract, that KC contract at $4.70, and very uh, strong resistance at $5.20. Of course, we're still continuing that downtrend that we started right after harvest. If you're looking at new crop for wheat, uh, you can forward contract uh, across Oklahoma somewhere between a minus 50 cents and a minus 28 cents off that uh, KC July 16 contract. Uh, that contract's about five and a quarter, so that gives our forward contract somewhere between 475 and almost five dollars around the, around Oklahoma. Let's talk about another low-priced crop right now: corn. Where are we at? Well, they're all about low price. You can talk corn, cotton, sorghum, but uh, corn prices have just uh, really been wallowing this week. Essentially, uh, no change on the corn. Uh, if you look over the last three weeks, we're about 25 cents below what we were three weeks ago. Uh, this week, just just pretty much sideways. Uh, that December corn contract has support about 372, a resistance at 396, a strong resistance at $4. If we could break that $4 uh, corn uh, level on that uh, Chicago December contract, we could get some movement. The, I think the problem there is is uh, producers around the, the nation have a lot of corn in the bin and they've been holding it waiting for higher prices. What's really driving the, 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 the factors in this? Well, the thing that the market's talking about is the weather you know if you look at uh, wheat prices the corn harvest is pretty much in and so it's in the bin and so you know you're watching plantings going on in the southern hemisphere but for wheat they're talking about uh, weather in the 2016 crop crop and with record uh, world ending stocks I just don't think so I think the funds shifting in and out of positions are moving the market and then you look at export demand uh, uh, it's projected for all US wheat to be even with last year right now it's 16 percent below you look at new 
uh, hard red winter wheat crop. It's projected to be about 11% below last year. It's 29%. So I think export demand is the big driving force with the funds coming in in the short run. So in, 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 in all of the world wheat, what how, how, how does the U.S. wheat compare to other countries? Well, if you look at, uh, we've got a wide variety of wheat. Right now, U.S. wheat on the average is priced above the world uh, other wheat, and that's why our exports are, are down as a percentage of, of what we'd expect them to be. Uh, we've got a good quality wheat, and I think why we're exporting with a higher price is because we can deliver a high quality product that they can buy and blend in their poor, uh, poor quality products. And, and has that been the trend over the past couple of years? Uh, it, that it has. Uh, you look over the last two years or so, we, we've been priced above the market, but still had relatively good exports. Okay, thank you much, Kim. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. We want to talk a little bit about the path to client success here at the Food and Ag Products Center today with Aaron Johnson, who handles business and marketing, client relations and coordination. Aaron, let's talk about this client success path model that you use and what exactly it is. Well, it's five steps essentially is what it is. And what it does is help us determine what services are available for that client, depending on where they fall within that path in those five steps. So for instance, if it is a entrepreneurial client, a first step that we want them to do is go to our basic training workshop, which is the one day workshop that goes through all the, th all the things they have to do in order to get their product on the shelf. So it's someone who has developed a product and kind of is starting from scratch in terms of getting it eventually in the store, hopefully. Yes. Why is it important to have something like this in place? The reason why this is in place is so that the client, when they get to a certain point, doesn't realize per se, like they didn't do their trademark registration. And so they've bought all this marketing material, bought their labels, their, their business cards, got their website up and running, and realized they didn't trademark that logo and somebody else has it. So they're infringing on somebody else's trademark, so they have to start over and they lose all that money and all that time that they've already put into it. So when someone is ready to get the ball rolling, what's the first step they need to take? After they contact the center, the first thing they need to do is enroll in that basic training workshop. And the, for more information, you need to look at our website to see when the next one is available. Now we mentioned small entrepreneurs getting started. What about a company that's larger and maybe a little more established? Is there an avenue for them? Yes, and they can come in at any point throughout our client success path because some of those services are offered within different steps and they just call us and let us know what type of service they're looking for whether it be having a sensory panel evaluation or doing some R&D work in our facility and we'll set that up until the project is complete. Okay, great. Erin, thank you very much. If you have a great idea and want to get the ball rolling, just go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu, and we have a link for you to the Food Nag Products Center. Finally today, remembering Dr. Marvin Stone, his commitment to students, to colleagues, and to agriculture. With this machine, we have uh, sensors on the front of the machine. This is one of those. It's been a, a real blow to the department, to the broader community. Uh, you, you just can't work with someone that long and, and someone as, as great as Marvin Bonnie and not be profoundly impacted by it. And the suddenness of it, of course, just compounds that. Pure genius, just absolutely a, a genius. And then humble and giving. Very good teacher. He, he taught students not just the knowledge side and also life, how, how to deal with the problems, all that kind of, he shared all his thought with, uh, with the student. Very, you can tell how much he influenced Dr. Wong and Dr. Weckler's teaching careers and even Dr. Jones. Um, most of the faculty here in the BAE department worked with him for a very long time. That's a plant soil sciences department and as an agronomist, you typically don't have many engineers on your committee and I was lucky enough where I had him and another engineer for both my master's and my PhD committee. So I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Stone since about 2003. He focused on agricultural electronics and 
as part of that, he was uh, an integral part of a team uh, of multidisciplinary researchers that developed the Green Seeker technology here at OSU. An engineer back in the 90s working with an agronomist or, or soil fertility specialist was it was extremely uncommon, just not something that happened a lot. And so him him working cross cross cutting and putting what he knew into the technology like that. And then, you know, that technology came out, it was on the market, and is, is a fairly expensive technology, something that the Oklahoma producer had more of a challenge to, to get into their system. That when they came back, this is prototypes that was built in his garage. Green Seeker is about sensing the needs of a plant uh, remotely and instantaneously, and then determining how much uh, nitrogen fertilizer to apply. Uh, based on that sensing. Technology that was developed that came for this one sensor head is now saving producers ten dollars per acre per year every year since it, it came out in the, the early 2000s. This works really revolutionized a lot of the bio and ag en engineering industry and he will definitely be remembered through his work. They keep telling me how Dr. Stone encouraged them in their career, in their whatever, trying to explore new things. He never once claimed to be anything, never once claimed to be even intelligent, um, but uh, he gave to everybody he knew. He's a good friend as well. Willing to do anything for, for anybody, um, just a joy to, and a delight to be around. Forever a teacher. That'll do it for us this week. We'll see you next time at SUNUP. Oh,